Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to another, another of our Managing Your Small Business Beyond the Pandemic webinar. This is number 115 in our series that originated back in March of 2020. Uh, got a great show today. Good afternoon. My name is Kelly Bearden. I am the director of the CSU Bakersfield Small Business Development Center. And today we're going to be talking about some new entrepreneurship programs over at California State University Bakersfield through their School of Business and Public Administration. A lot of exciting things happening in entrepreneurship uh, throughout our region and especially in Kern County. And we're going to go into a lot of those details today. So thanks for joining us. And uh, we'll bring our guest speaker in in a little bit. We'll go through some of the pandemic relief programs that are out there that we haven't discussed. We'll hit on our economic corner and a few other things. But first, so let's talk a little bit about what's going on. What is going on today, May 25th, 2022? Well, we're going to have news today. We're going to get a, 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 our our Dean of the School of Business and Public Administration, uh, Dr. John Stark will be joining us and he will be providing us news on the new CSUB Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. Uh, some of the programs are now starting to be in the planning stage, but there are, he will be able to provide us a lot of, of the information that is uh, gonna happen at this center a much needed center for entrepreneurship and innovation uh, within the School of Business and Public Administration. So he will be joining us. He is actually at a conference in the Antelope Valley and he is leaving that conference en route to our campus over in the Antelope Valley. Many of you might not realize that there are two CSUB campuses, one in, of course, Bakersfield and the other serving uh, the vast area of the Antelope Valley that is actually located in Northern in LA County. Um, so he will be joining us from that campus. So our economic focus continues. We uh, started a little thing called the Economic Corner. And the Economic Corner was kind of developed for a few reasons. One is because uh, the general economic pattern and what is happening in uh, the economics, macroeconomics of this country and really globally um, is almost unprecedented. And it has such an impact on so many businesses, so many of our small businesses. And having the most recent and current news on that is going to help uh, a lot of our small businesses. So we are gonna talk a little bit and do our thing on the economic focus and continue with our economic corner and talk a little bit about that today. We will also have news on recovery programs and small business confidence. You know, small business confidence is such a huge, huge issue that uh, happens and, you know, it, it is really important for many reasons. Uh, one of those reasons is that uh, with uh, businesses that are confident are more likely to sustain their operations or even grow their operations than those that are not confident. Um, and we are at a level to where we are at some of our lowest levels of all time. Um, and we will discuss that a little bit as well. So, um, Getting back to, you know, our news on the uh, recovery, we'll also have an update on up an open pandemic relief programs. As we've wound down those, uh, we have far fewer uh, economic programs that we are actually looking at and really assisting clients with, but there are still some that are open and still very viable. So there are ones that really need to be considered if you uh, have the opportunity to still access those and need the funds because of the pandemic. And as always, we'll take your questions. If, today, if you would, please, if you have a question for, for Dean Stark or for uh, myself on any of the programs that are going on, please go to the Q&A box, our question and answer, and we will get to those at the close of the Dean's presentation today. So again, please use the Q&A box for that. We will be putting some programs and some other comments in the chat box. Uh, our executive producer, Maureen Bushterdang is here and she is actually uh, really a trooper today. Really, go, you know, she's uh, battling, she's playing injured today and actually manning our chat in our back office and our back scene of today's webinar. So she will be there for questions and chat and a poll. So let's go on with our poll and start with our poll today. So we have two, two uh, questions today. 
And actually, our poll questions are going to be um, actually, uh, the first one is going to be a two-part question. And it's kind of related to where you hope to be. What is your business goal for the next? And this is a very generic business goal. And it has to do with our consumer or small business confidence issue that we're talking about. So we'll have a two-part question for question number one, and then a second question. So here we go with question number one. And it's basically just what is your business goal for the next 12 months? Is it to stay the course? Is it to sustain your business and survive? Stay the course, your first option. Is it to streamline? Are you looking at reducing some of your operations? Or are you looking to grow or expand your business? And then uh, the second part of the question is, um, you know, how optimistic of you that, are, are, that this will occur? So say, for example, your goal is to expand your business. How opportunity? How optimistic are you? Are you very sure, sure, or not too sure? So a two-parter. So number one is, where do you hope over the next 12 months your business will take you? A lot going on in the world, a lot of economic conditions, a lot of opportunity, though. Uh, we saw with the pandemic where it did affect the business results of about four out of five of our small businesses. Still, there was that 20% that grew and expanded during the pandemic. So where do you hope to go? So just a little basic question to kick things off. So what is your business goal for the next 12 months? One question, no right answer. And what we will do is stop the poll. We do have 72% of you participating. Thank you for your participation. The second part of that question was how optimistic are you that this will occur? So we're going to go ahead and in that first poll question, the two-parter, and we're going to share the results with you at this time. And what you're going to see here is that what is your business goal for the next 12 months? Well, 56% of you are going to look to expand or grow your business. That is phenomenal. Absolutely outstanding. And 22% of you are looking to perhaps cut back or reduce some of your business operations by streamlining. And 17% of you are looking to stay the course and actually just kind of uh, plow away. So we did have 1% of you that didn't have a, an answer there, but so I'm assuming that was an other. And if it was other, uh, other than stay the course, streamline your business, grow your business, go ahead and put it in the chat. So that was the first part of our first two-part question. And, you know, I've, actually, I am a little bit surprised that 56% of you are looking to grow or expand. I think that's fantastic in, in view of the economic uncertainty that we have at this time. But uh, actually, really good to see. So, so we're looking at um, part two of that question. And 56% of you are pretty sure, are sure that that's going to happen. That's good. Another 33%. So I, I like the confidence level of our audience today. So that's great. And good news to hear. So thank you for participating in that first poll. We'll stop that share and we'll go to our, our last poll question. And, you know, when I ask a poll question about the economy and how your business is going, I got to have something a little bit fun or challenging. Maybe, who knows, maybe this is a challenging question. So our whimsical question of the day will come up. And I'll share this with you. So when you're driving State Route 99 from Bakersfield to Fresno, what town is in the midway point? One answer, one town is in the middle or close enough to the middle. Is it Tipton? Is it Tulare? Or is it Pixley? So this question was actually asked of me back in the 1990s when I didn't, had never driven between Fresno or, and Bakersfield or from Bakersfield to Fresno. So, but there was an answer on that. And, um, and I found out then back in the nineties. And, and so now every time I'm driving between Bakersfield and, and maybe my Fresno is my destination and, or maybe beyond, I will sit there and go, Hey, I'm halfway there, halfway to Fresno now. So we do have 62% of you participating in our whimsical question. You know, from Bakersfield to Fresno is roughly about 106 miles, 108 miles. And so roughly, you know, the very closest of these three options, what is it? Is it Tipton, Tulare, and Pixley? 
62% of you. Last chance to jump in, if you want to guess. We'll end the poll with 62% of you then. And now we have 66% of you that participated. Let me share those results with you. So driving between Bakersfield and Fresno, 67% of you think that that's Tulare. Um, Tulare's an hour away from Bakersfield. Uh, it's, uh, th we have three cities that are really close. Uh, the second choice on that was Pixley, 33%, but nobody wanted Tipton. And the correct answer to this is Tipton. I stumped the audience my first time ever. I feel like I have finally come up with a tough poll question. So the whimsical question of the day, now that you know the halfway point between Fresno and Bakersfield is the thriving metropolis of Tipton. Okay, that was, that was fun, at least for me. Uh, not so sure about everybody else, but it was fun for me. So thank you for participating. Um, and let's move on. So moving on right now is usually we go to this status, but I'm going to do something a little bit different today. Let me, let me change my share position and let's kind of go to, um, let's go to another option here. Let's look at something else if it works for us. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Um, but trying to get my other screen up and of course, so let me try again. If you don't first succeed, I try and try again. And it doesn't like this, but uh, let's see if we can get the internet up. And really the internet was gonna host a few things for us here. It was gonna host um, um, a few things, a few questions that we have. So let me try stopping that share and doing a whole complete share. Sometimes Zoom and I are not the best of friends and it appears that that is the case right now. So trying to move on and get my, um, get my internet up. There we go. And so let's share. And what I wanted to do is just kind of look at something. I wanted to look at it for our economics corner that we've started a few weeks back. Uh, there was an interesting article that I wanted to share with you, and it was 15 ways consumers can deal with and benefit from rising inflation. Now, I know that we all carry this, uh, this great load of being not only business owners that are uh, dealing with inflation, but on the other side of things, you have that relationship to where you're a consumer as well. So I thought this was kind of interesting to look at 15 ways that consumers, and we won't look at all 15, we'll look at a few, but there's ways that consumers can deal with it and then look at it from the business side of things. So let me scroll down here. And the first one is something I want to look at later on in another week coming up. And that is what your inflation rate is. This is something I actually, an exercise I went through last weekend. And you can actually look up and you can determine what your inflation rate is. Right now, we know the inflation rate is annually adjusted at 8.6%, the highest it's been in 40 years. So, but that can vary. It can vary geographically where you live. It can, it can vary on the products and services that you are buying the bulk of. So what is your inflation rate? Uh, you, beware of shrinkflation. We talked about shrinkflation a few weeks back when we had Dr. Evans uh, on and talking more about the economy and shrinkflation is basically just sizes of products generally growing uh, smaller. It can be services that also are measured no longer in an hour timeline, but in maybe 50 minutes or 45 minutes. Uh, we see shrinkflation, I think in a couple of products really kind of really are the bellwether of shrinkflation and that could be your five pound sack of sugar that now weighs four pounds. So you can look at that and um, my business math probably on the fly is not going to be so good, but that's going to either be 20 or 25% less. And so if you're talking about 20 or 25% less product, that obviously is a new way of not increasing the price, but reducing the amount that you get. Um, the same thing happened with ice cream when it was sold in half gallons, but it was done in two intervals to where it went down to 56 ounces, a cup less, and now 48 ounces is what you find. So, um, you see shrinkflation, shrinkflation, now shrinkflation. So also delaying social security is really kind of a consumer thing rather than a business, isn't it? 
Well, not if you're looking to retire from your business and sell. So that is an actually a process that you can go through. One of, I think, the best ones is what's happened in the used and new car market over the last year or maybe even longer. And it's really provided an opportunity for those that were in car leases, because generally you were able to purchase a car at uh, the least value that was much smaller. So if you have a car you use in your business, you have a fleet of cars that are leased. That is an analysis that you really want to do and you really want to look at in order to do that. My favorite, favorite, of course, always is going to be to seek a higher return on happiness. Um, so when you seek a higher return on happiness, it's when prices are soaring, uh, your favorite defensive strategy could be to take a moment and see what you're spending and why. And that could also be true in your business and your, your other issues. The thing that all businesses need to be aware of is you have this that you already are probably seeing, many of you have seen, and that's employees that are looking for a raise. And so that is something that consumers and something that you are all looking at. So it's just kind of a, uh, an interesting analysis on when you see such a, a change in the consumer pricing index and how it affects consumers that you are also all consumers, but also how it affects you as a business owners. One of these could be a control your lifestyle creep. And essentially lifestyle creep is a, is a phrase where uh, if essentially if you have in, inflated cost, then you're going to have an inflated um, cost of that lifestyle that you're maintaining. But this comes down to basically, you're gonna basically be reducing or reducing your purchases in order to keep the amount of expenses that you are incurring either in your business or in your household the same. So anyway, I thought that that was an interesting analysis and kind of a good thing for economic corner that we have nowadays. So, I see our esteemed guest has joined us. I am going to jump into a few more slides and introduce him. But first of all, I'm going to, there's a quick look at our relief programs that are still open. Uh, the California Dream Fund program, if you are interested, there is the email address that you can, can become, uh, our Kern County micro grant program is still open. The first checks for that program were actually cut last week. Even though the program's been open since uh, February, we're on our third iteration of the application. Numerous uh, changes between Sacramento and uh, Bakersfield on that. So uh, it is open. It is going to be open for quite a while from what I can guess. Our friends in Mono County have a grant program and forgivable loan program. You're going to want to contact uh, potentially, you're going to want to contact one of the Jeffs there. So Jeff Simpson, the economic development director in Mono County, or Jeff Lucas, their consultant. Idle is closed. The employee retention credit is still open retroactively. And we've had guests come on and say that this is a program that has been underutilized by many small businesses and really something that they have a great opportunity still, you know, in order to provide pandemic relief if you're business was impacted from the pandemic. Um, and there's a few other programs that are open. Uh, the Dream Phone program was created uh, last year by Senate Bill 151 to seed entrepreneurship and small business creation in underserved business groups that are facing capital and opportunity gaps. Uh, statewide, it's $35 million. Uh, it's not enough money to go around. I think that there is going to be more money added to it. But then again, I am the eternal optimist when it comes to small business. Uh, what you get for that is you get a, a pretty much a training program. You get assistance with business planning. You get one-on-one -on -one consulting. And then you also get the opportunity to get five to $10,000 at the end. Um, if you sign up for it, I can guarantee you the first three, the last one, I am unsure if everybody is going to be able to receive that money by jumping through those particular hoops, but that remains to be seen. So with the California Dream Fund, um, there's what you have. You have to be in a um, established legal entity after July 1st. There are conditions on that, and they can go through with you. The training topics are going to be uh, these 11 topics and eight of these 11 are going to be discussed at any given time. 
uh, comes down to the project feasibility and your wonderful entrepreneurial mindset and into business planning and communication. I know this is something we've talked about since January, but it is still going on and it is still happening. And there's still an opportunity for you. Uh, one of my favorites, of course, being the finance guy in the room is going to be assessing your capital, your ex your capital needs and financial literacy. So there's those particular programs. Also, we have coming and we'll have guests coming uh, in the next couple of months from the iBank uh, as part of the uh, Office of Small Business Advocate in, in uh, as part of GoBiz. So they will be directing some of this, what is now $900 million, not $1.1 billion, $900 million. And then also the California Pollution Control Authority will have some loan programs that make it easier for you expanding businesses. And we know 56% of you are planning to grow and expand your business throughout the next year. So if you need capital in order to do this, this is going to be a program that we hopefully will be able to do something with. It came out of the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, 10 billion from the federal treasury of which these are the amounts that are going to the state of California. It's interesting, the state of California did have a 200 million of that of, uh, allocated for venture capital funds. And it is supposed to go to your underrepresented venture capital managers, your underserved entrepreneurs and business owners, those that are in geographic areas and social economically disadvantaged, and also climate equity and climate justice. So 200 million statewide, more details on that in the next couple of months. Hopefully we can tie some of this $200 million in to uh, what we're gonna be talking about with, uh, with this gentleman right here, with today's special guest, Dr. John Stark, who's gonna be talking about a lot of things that are happening in the School of Business and Public Administration, the School of Business and Public Administration. Uh, of course, we're biased, but probably Dean Stark and I would say probably our favorite school at California State University, Bakersfield. He is in his second stint of uh, interim dean of the school. Previously, he has served as the associate dean for the school and also the department chair for management and marketing department. He has been involved with the California State University system since 2000. He also served as the interim director of the doctoral program in educational leadership. And he also continues to do instruction in both public and private sectors. He had a vast private sector experience in many industries that included convenience stores, recreational boating, particularly my favorite industry, uh, Dr. Stark, but uh, also government purchasing and facilities, retail sales and higher education. Um, John and his wife, Jenny, enjoy travel, big fans of our most recent states, Alaska and Hawaii. Dr. Stark, thank you for joining us. We're really looking forward to this overview of what is this Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation and welcome. Take it away. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, uh, Kelly, and uh, everyone here on the webinar. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, invitation, for this opportunity. I've uh, been looking forward to it. Um, and we've got a lot of good things going on. Uh, a lot of ways we're going to be able to serve this region and some exciting programs that we're developing. So first of all, just so that you uh, uh, keep, in, keep this in mind, the School of Business and Public Administration at Cal State Bakersfield uh, is the only uh, uh, university that's fully accredited uh, within 100 miles. So in the southern San Joaquin Valley and over here into the Antelope Valley, uh, which is where I'm actually coming from uh, to you today as I attended a, a, a conference over here, um, is, uh, is really the main educational source uh, for our region. And I say Maine because we also are accredited. We don't just have the regional accreditation that you have that uh, everybody's supposed to have, the WASC accreditation for our region. Um, and we're not just accredited by a group that uh, is accredited at the federal level to um, uh, be able to do financial aid and things of that nature. But we're AACSB, which the, is the Association for the Advancement of College Schools of Business. Uh, this is an organization that is one of the top accreditors in the world, and it actually buys or, or ties its value 
back to the ISO 9000 standards, well, so the International Standards Organization. So uh, we are really tasked with providing top quality education. And we do this in several ways. One, we do it by making sure that you have professors that are uh, have been highly trained. We have most of uh, the professors you would have in a lot of our classes are gonna be PhDs. Uh, but like me, most of us are what I call retreads. We started out in industry lost her mind at some point, went back, got a university uh, degree, got the PhD. Uh, and now when we're teaching, we're able to blend both uh, uh, practical lessons from the real world with what we've learned in the labs and what we've learned in research and what we've learned uh, in theory to give you the best overall uh, guidance and preparation that we can for the business world. Uh, our accreditation means our programs must be constantly upgraded and we have to have a strategy that fits the region. And that really is the foundation that leads me to, to be here today, because um, uh, in the last couple of years, uh, actually during the pandemic, the, our region moved forward because it completed the B3K, uh, uh, beautiful Bakersfield, Bountiful Kern, I may have that backwards, but uh, the B3K project, which was an economic analysis of our area to determine what it is that we really needed uh, to move forward and to continue growth and really uh, to expand our opportunities in our region for everybody, for all of our citizens, for all of our people in this region. And one of the the things that they determined was that here in this region, we do a very good job of having kind of an, entrepreneur, an entrepreneurial spirit. We have people that will get businesses started and get things going. But the problem is that while we start those businesses in comparisons with other regions across the country of similar uh, scope, size, and composition, we, we, again, we start them at similar numbers, ours crash a lot faster and a lot higher numbers. So the problem is we've got people who want to get started, want to get going, but they don't have the ability, they don't have the infrastructure, they don't have the support to keep those businesses going, to scale them up and to see them grow and develop. So one of the things that um, we've learned out of this project is that we need infrastructure support here uh, in the Southern San Joaquin over into uh, the Antelope Valley and north over into Mono County. We need that kind of infrastructure, uh, infrastructure support. So what has happened is we have created a, a center called the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, the CEI. And we've uh, been given uh, $1.2 million. This is an endowment. We're supposed to spend this money to, in the next uh, uh, three to four years, to be able to start really providing structure for people with ideas who want to start things, who want to grow things. Uh, that's the purpose of this. In addition, we've been given a $1 million that is an endowment uh, to fund social entrepreneurship so that as we build these, building, uh, these businesses, as we get things going, we also are making sure that people are imbued with values. Don't forget that you are a citizen of a community. As your business grows, your community should grow with you. As you benefit, your community should benefit with you because it's that symbiosis between the businesses and their communities that really will support uh, the ability of a business to, to scale up, to grow, to do big things. But it's only, again, if they're in, uh, uh, in sync with their community. So we have money to be able to make sure we support that. So with that kind of financial backing, what are we going to do? We're going to start with the idea of an accelerator. And an accelerator is a 10 week program that we would be meeting on Saturdays. We'll provide a, a, a workspace in our graduate labs and whatnot to be able to follow up. So it's not just those three or four hours and then, then what do you do? We're gonna provide space for people to be able to work with their teams or with whoever it is that they're putting these ideas together with. And during this 10 weeks, the process is called ideation. We want to help you go from that back of the envelope, that idea that you, you've got, you always wondered if it, if it might work. We want to get you through that uh, to the point where you would really be in a position to make a pitch to uh, an angel investor or to uh, your bank if, that, if you're going for some sort of loan. We want to be able to help you put that together. So kind of like that DREAM Act, that list you might remember here just a few minutes ago uh, that Kelly had of 11 different topics. Basically, we're going to incorporate those kinds of things into this 10-week program. It'll be three hours uh, a day is the way we envision it over these uh, uh, 10 weeks. 
And at the end of that pro uh, program, then we will have an opportunity for uh, these teams to make pitches uh, to uh, angel investors and um, uh, hopefully to be able to get the funding to get these things going. Now, idea in the long run is to help support those uh, uh, angel investors' uh, investments uh, by supporting those small businesses as they get going, uh, providing uh, uh, expertise, backup, ask, answer questions and whatever. And, if, and what we really will be doing is hooking them ultimately into um, our advising uh, and uh, consulting groups through the Small Business Development Center that Kelly runs, the SBDC. So the, the idea is, from the beginning, from ideation all the way through launch and all and through growth, we can provide a structure that will provide you with knowledge, information, access uh, to capital, access to the kinds of uh, technologies maybe that you might need, um, all those kinds of things we want to be able to support you with. Uh, for example, one of the things that uh, a lot of people don't realize, at Cal State, we have a fab lab. Uh, a fabrication lab. So we have digi 3D digital printers, we've got all kinds of woodworking, we've got um, uh, things to uh, cut various cutting tools and things to, to make mock-ups, to make prototypes. We've got the ability to support ideas uh, uh, with that. Um, we would, uh, we've got support through our classes and student groups, whether it's engineers, whether it's um, um, uh, business plans through our, our MBA program or uh, some of our uh, advanced programs and um, uh, the undergrad programs, the senior projects and whatnot. We've got a lot of opportunities where we have students that are looking for ideas to flesh out, to analyze, to help you pull together a plan. And all this comes together ultimately through the CEI. So again, that's the Center for Entrepreneurship um, and Innovation. Our intent is to get our first cohort uh, together uh, by the middle to the end of uh, July and launch that cohort. Uh, it'll be a mix of, uh, excuse me, professors uh, who have practical experience as well as uh, uh, the academic training. So you get really expert help, but they'll be mixed with uh, people from the community who are actually involved in uh, business right now. So you get very much a real world as well as um, uh, the support and the technical education. We're gonna be able to provide all of that. And with the idea that by, um, you know, sometime in September, we'd be in a position to graduate that first cohort and to begin making pitches to uh, hopefully get some funding for some of these folks. And one idea is to hook them through the Dream Mac, because if we can get their training uh, together, then that would give us an opportunity for uh, some of these um, uh, graduates, if you will, of this cohort to be able to apply for the Dream Act, which is uh, five to $10,000 worth of funding uh, that uh, a qualifying group can potentially get. So that the idea is not only do you flesh out this plan, flesh out this idea, but you actually have some funding to make it a reality. And we'll do our best to uh, get those things launched and, and do what we can. Um, we know Obviously, not everything's going to work, but the thing is, you've got to try. And the point is that if we can provide the infrastructure to support and better uh, platform scaffold these businesses as they're getting uh, off um, and getting uh, going, if we can put them on a firmer foundation, they ought to be much more successful in the long run. And then hooking them up with the SBDC to help them as they transition and go through various uh, growing pains and uh, through the life cycle of a business. Um, this will hopefully provide this kinds of structure that we've been lacking in the past and help us turn the fact that, again, our region creates small businesses uh, at a at least equal, if not higher rate than others, but help get us through that first two, three, four years so that our businesses are able to survive, they are able to thrive, and they are able to grow and really make an impact on the region. As we look down the pike, I mean, you, you all have been hearing this, uh, between climate change and the drought and all the water emergencies, um, it looks like we're going to end up pulling about a third of our production in agriculture uh, in the South Valley out of production because we, we just don't have the water uh, to be able to support it. Um, and continuing, uh, you know, who knows uh, that, where that stops. Uh, we look at oil and energy in our historic uh, areas. Those, of course, are under tremendous pressure. So if we're looking to the future and what Kern uh, County, what the Southern San Joaquin, what Antelope Valley, what Mono County needs to have, we're going to have to come up with innovation. 
We've got amazing things going on in aerospace and high tech out in the Eastern Kern areas uh, in the Antelope Valley, uh, whether China Lake or Edwards, uh, all kind of interestingly centered there on the Mojave Spaceport. Um, we've got amazing technologies and possibilities there, but we need to grow those and we've got to figure out how to commercialize those and then scale those as well as finding those new ideas uh, and developing things here um, in, in the Central Valley as well. Um, we've got some tremendous assets. We've got a population of very hardworking people that know what it is to work. We've got people who are willing to learn. So we've got the human capital. If we can help them with the business knowledge and the business acumen so that they can convert those skills and those strengths uh, into real productivity, uh, we ought to be in great shape. We also have something that places like uh, uh, LA and, and the Silicon Valley don't have. We've got dirt. We've still got places where you can uh, build uh, facilities. Uh, we've got places and it's still affordable. Uh, we've got amazing transportation linkages. Um, uh, I forget the, the numbers, but uh, you know, within about six hours, it's something like 30 some odd million people that you could be uh, in contact with. So we've got great location. There are all kinds of things that support the growth of industry here in our region. But we need to take charge of that, and we need to do it by not just relying on our historic industries uh, of oil and ag. We're going to have to figure out how to grow these, come up with those new ideas, and make things happen. Whether it's things like, uh, and we can already see it, businesses like Bitwise and, uh, and some of the others that have grown in these areas and are taking off, we need more of those. And the way we do that is to provide the infrastructure and the support to give people the help that they need to grow. Now, I will come back to this uh, at some point, but um, if you're interested in, uh, in uh, our accelerated program or are learning more about the CEI, uh, you can call us at the, the School of Business and Public Administration at 661-654-2157. So again, that's 661-654-2157. That's the School of Business and Public Administration. And uh, just, uh, the, you'll get, I forget which number it is, but uh, get to the Dean's office uh, and ask for Dr. Bach. Uh, Dr. Sundbach is our uh, uh, Associate Dean and he's actually the Executive Director of our CEI, our Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. He ran a very successful center up at Sacramento State uh, for a number of years. And we've been fortunate to get him down here. He's our Associate Dean and he's the Director of our center and will be the one leading us through getting it launched and helping it grow. So again, uh, contact us. You, you can also check us out uh, on the web uh, at BPA. Um, uh, you can, uh, at CSUB uh, slash BPA, you can get to a website at the School of Business and Public Administration and there'll be information there uh, as well as we work into the summer. We got all this uh, money here just in the last couple of months. We're putting it all together. Um, uh, from a certain point of view, we're operating just like an entrepreneur does. We're, um, uh, we're building this airplane while we fly it. Uh, so there's a lot of things that will be fleshed out and built out through the summer and into the fall. But again, we're trying to launch our first cohort uh, by mid to late July. And if you're interested in being part of that, please get a hold of us and, and we'll be glad to work with you. So Kelly, that's, that's kind of a, an overview of uh, where we're at. What, what questions might I answer or, or what things should I include? Well, I'm going to have a few questions and I hope uh, those in our audience do too. And you can put those in the Q&A box and we'll get Dr. Stark to answer them. Uh, John, on a bigger, on a, the bigger picture, has it really been determined yet of, you know, we're, we're starting with this accelerator and when we get closer to identifying dates and things like that, I'll invite you or, or Dr. Bach or Dr. Woods to come in, come back on webinar Wednesday and we'll just gear that toward that whole first accelerator and give people a chance to really dig into it and see if it fits them, if it fits other people or people that they know. Because that's the one great thing about some of these newer programs that benefit startups and those wanting to start businesses is that it seems like we all know somebody out there. So with that in mind, um, and we'll do that later, these, this is going to be uh, the first step of this entrepreneurial center. And so what 
is going to happen afterwards? Has there been kind of anything over the course of the three years or so that this funding is designated for? Are there is there been any other things identified? Um, at this point in time, our basic remit is to develop uh, infrastructure to support entrepreneurship and uh, the launch and growth of small businesses. So what we're doing is uh, we've already established a, uh, an advisory board of uh, local uh, entrepreneurs and small business folks to, to give us background and make sure that we, that we keep grounded in the community and we stay very real. Um, and as we grow and figure out what the special needs are, uh, and what, where, are the, where are the holes, where are the gaps in knowledge and whatnot? As I said, we're going to start with basically those same 11 points that you showed with the DREAM Act. But um, uh, as we get into it, we'll find out what other things we need to add. What I hope to have down the line is that we'd have this accelerator. And again, that's the ideation. That's getting the very basic funding to get started. What we'd like to pair with that is an incubator. Uh, within the next uh, couple of years. Now, an incubator would be a space where quite literally, when you get a small business started, you don't have, you can't afford to have a receptionist. You can't afford to have a fancy office space. But what happens is you create an office space with um, um, all the support. You've got support staff kind of in a central area with businesses, if you will, and they're basically offices right around that support staff. And then when somebody calls that business's uh, a phone number or sends them an email, they're answered by that very professional support staff. And then their that call or, or whatever the connection is, that then is sent over to the uh, to that individual business there in, the, in their office. We'd have a, a very nice conference room available so that people that want to have meetings and want to impress people by having a nice space. That would all be part of uh, this incubator idea. Um, and these are the kinds of things that would be uh, uh, where you have central services, things of that nature. That's what this incubator would really support. Um, we are thinking down the road about trying to create maker space. So for the businesses that are thinking more in the idea of producing things, actually building things, uh, that would be an expansion. So the Fab Lab I mentioned would give us an idea to build prototypes. But if we could have maker space, uh, down the road where people could actually have areas that they could begin to produce uh, maybe short, small runs of products. That, that would be another thing that we would work toward. That's further down the road, but that's the idea there. So that what we would be able to do from our footprint there at Cal State Bakersfield is that we would be able to create businesses that have launched, gotten some initial funding, beginning to actually create market, create sales and things of that nature, and are then ready to move off on their own, start hiring employees. At that point, that's when we pass them off to you, Kelly, and uh, your consultants to help them scale up and uh, keep that growing. But if we have this kind of hand in hand, accelerator to incubator to launch with support from the SBDC, now we've got infrastructure that supports these people all the way through this process, and we should not have that drop off that we've been experiencing. Fantastic. I, I know there's a role in this for our student interns also. Uh, the student intern program that we've had at the SBDC has, uh, I, I think it's been our best program we've, we've done in 10 years. And I know that there's a role for this student environment in this uh, student intern where they can interact maybe with, with our senior level, with the uh, individuals in the accelerator. Uh, where do you see that going and hopefully growing into the future? Well, that's a that's a great question. And so the the uh, the students that work as junior consultants, we want to keep that program going. We'd love to see it expand. And if we have more of these small businesses, we potentially have additional funding that we can get those. Uh, maybe what we'd be able to do is have a student consultant that would actually be paired up fairly early in this product cycle or a company life cycle with each of these organizations. So they've got somebody as an outside set of eyes, somebody who's trained in these kinds of things to help them and coach them, uh, work with them right along the way. So that would be one idea. The other is that um, we have entrepreneurship classes and we have our senior projects at the undergrad level. We have senior, we have um, uh, graduation projects at the MBA level. And what we've been trying to do is work more and more towards the point where those would be actual companies, either that they're making up or they're working with or things of that nature. So down the line, what I would love to see is that we've got enough of these small companies going that I can start having projects given to these student teams 
And now each of these small little companies will have an opportunity to have four or five bright young minds focused on their idea and giving them some real good guidance and real good support in a business plan, in a marketing plan, um, in an operations plan, whatever it is that they specifically need, given some real guidance and all of this course to the business would be free. It'd be wonderful experience for our students. And the really cool thing, I've been involved in some of these before coming up in my own uh, education. It's really awesome to be able to say, you know what, you look at a business and say, believe it or not, I helped start that or I helped support that when they got going. And that's what I would really look to do because again, as I said, with our social entrepreneurship, we want businesses connected to the community. And if we've got students involved, then that's part of that community connection that just is would, would be the height of what we want. Well, we're excited at the SPDC. After, after carrying the entrepreneurial ball for CSUB for the last uh, 12 years, uh, we're excited this program is happening. We want to work any way we can with you. Uh, we're, and we're really excited because we have such good counselors and the access to capital. And there's so many exciting things that are happening in Kern County at this time and even, even regionally and statewide on bringing more capital and greater access for small businesses and startup projects. So we're really, we're really looking forward to that aspect of it. Um, and, and actually with the small business, uh, we're talking about the uh, student interns. You know, we've worked with a handful of clients do crowdfunding projects. And, and you can do a crowdfunding project where it involves just the, basically uh, the family and friends of the individuals. It gets that family and friends and the individual business owners themselves all invested in their projects which future funders really wanna see. They wanna see that all in attitude and they wanna see that they're up against the wall. And I really think that we have an opportunity now to really expand this. It shouldn't be a handful. It should be uh, dozens of handfuls of projects that we do. And I really think that by coordinating that with some of our student teams and some of the other things and involving some of our faculty in the finance area, that we have a great opportunity here. Oh, I, I completely agree. And and. One of the things I even saw, again, I was uh, fortunate uh, uh, watching uh, some of these other uh, uh, programs that I, I was exposed to as I came up through my own program, um, having student teams, one of the nice things about it is they have youth and they have fresh eyes. And they, they're not afraid to ask the questions. Uh, I remember one organization that one of the student teams I was involved with, um, uh, they had this tremendous amount of inventory and they kept buying all this inventory and the student was able to step up and say, why? You know, the, the, the owner kept wondering, well, where's all my money? Well, it's all in your inventory. You know, you got to stop buying so much inventory and think about inventory turns. So it's just those fresh eyes and that innocence to be able to ask those really to the core questions that sometimes a business owner is so involved in the day-to-day -day fight they just don't stop and think. So students bring fresh eyes, fresh perspective. Um, and like I say, that innocence to just ask those straight up questions. Like uh, I remember that one situation, the owner complaining about not having the cash to do things and the students saying, well, why do you have so much inventory? You know, it's just, those are the kinds of things we need to have happen. So can I, you want to answer or can I address a couple of these questions I see in the Q&A? Yeah, let, let me start with the first one. Is there a website where I can apply for the Accelerator 10-week program? Okay, at this point, this is in, under construction. What I would suggest that you do is I'm going to, I'm going to throw my uh, executive director under the bus here. Uh, I'm going to suggest that uh, you put, you email S-B-A-C-H. So that's S B. -A -C -H. A C H at csub.eud. Okay, so that's at csub.eud. What you're doing is you're uh, you're um, uh, sending an email to Dr. Bach, who is our executive director for this, and just send him a heads up that you're interested. And as soon as we get everything together, we're developing the application and all of that, then we'll make sure that you get an email to tell you exactly how to get to the site and what you need to do. So again, that's S Bach. B-A-C-H at csub.edu uh, and just let him know, hey, I heard the, the SBDC webinar, um, interested about the CEI, can you send me more information when it's available? And he'll be happy to do that. Fantastic. So, and I'm sure Maureen will have that in the chat box momentarily, uh, knowing how efficient she is. Um, 
Next question is, is there a cost to attend the 10 week accelerator program? Okay, that's the really good news. The cost is zero. Uh, our funders uh, want this to really take off and really to grow. And the whole idea here is to not provide any barriers. We wanna make sure that people with good ideas, that's the, uh, the discriminative, uh, that's how we make choices, if you will, uh, about what goes through. The, do they have something? Do they look like they're committed? That's what we want to be able to do, uh, not anything else. So cost should not be a barrier, and that's what our funders want. So there'll be no cost for this, but we will be uh, looking to see how committed people are. Uh, a lot of times, if you've got money in the game, yeah, you got skin in the game, you might be more uh, committed. Well, we're going to try to do it a different way. So there won't be any cost uh, with this, and we'll go forward with that. So then also, um... A follow-up question to that, is there going to be any type of online or Zoom option for that, or is it going to be all in person? At this point in time, uh, our, our inclination is to do it in person. Uh, and here's the reason why. Ultimately, and you all know this, business is about people and it's about relationships. And what we want you to do as a, a budding entrepreneur, if you're just getting started, I don't care how many of you may have already started. We want to get to know you so that we know how to best support you and we want to make connections and you're going to develop a network of people out of this um, uh, experience that you'll be able to fall back on in various areas, uh, because all of our people who will be teaching and leading out are committing to also being there if you have follow up questions at whenever uh, down the road that you might have them. Well, the way you really do that and do that effectively is in person. So at this point, I think we're going to focus on in-person uh, and uh, build those networks. Now, down the line, uh, especially as we think about, well, how do we connect to maybe the, some of the farther uh, areas, the more difficult to get to uh, in our region, we'll have to look at that down the road. But initially, we're going to do it face-to-face. -face. Fantastic. How are you marketing this new 10-week free program? Well, we have uh, ultimately what we'll be doing is reaching out through a variety of, uh, of media outlets. Uh, we will obviously go to the, the standard news media outlets. Uh, we also have a, a list of people. We've got several hundred people over the last five, 10 years uh, that uh, Jeremy Woods has been working with, for example, in entrepreneurship and his connections. We'll use some of his email lists to make sure that we get the word out. Uh, we'll we'll uh, turn to, to Kelly and his crew at the SBDC see uh, to put the word out. Um, so we'll do everything we can to get the word out. Uh, and I would think that what will probably happen probably in the next three to four, four weeks max, but probably in the next three weeks or so, you'll start seeing information on this. And is there a class size? Um, at this point, we're going to wait and see how much um, uh, uh, interest there is. We don't want too big of a class. My guess is we'll probably it'll be 30 or less uh, to get started because we want to make sure. And that's because we expect some of the, those will be teams. It's not that we have 30 different potential businesses. Out of that, we may have a dozen teams. Right. And then uh, so people could potentially come in with their team or their people that they want to work with because we want them to be able to all get the same kind of information and to grow with that. Uh, so that they have can hit the ground running as a as a team to, to launch. Now, some of them, yeah, are going to be singles, but there may we're going to have room for people to bring, like I say, a team of uh, uh, one or two others maybe with them to, to participate in the training. Uh, and then we'll provide them space to be able to think about things and flesh out ideas. OK, the next question, I guess, is for me. Sorry, Dr. Stark. <laughs> uh, and Maureen did place Dr. Bach's email in the chat. So if you need that, pull it right there. Um, the next question was, here it is. I think I need, oh, it has, has to do with the, uh, where can I go to get more information on the employee retention credit, the ERC? Uh, you know, it's a complicated thing. We, we send a lot of people either to their accountant or we send it to um, potentially their, um, um, their payroll service, but we do have somebody on, on site. So if I can help you with that, I can help you potentially with that, with that Jim. Um, send me an email. Um, let's see. Lastly, what else we have here? 
Okay. Um, not seeing much more. Dr. Stark, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, this has been my pleasure. And uh, uh, again, I, I uh, owe a colleague who provided me access to her office to be able to, to connect with you. Um, uh, we had uh, over here at the uh, EDGE conference, um, we were uh, looking at uh, uh, Damon Jones uh, was uh, the speaker of uh, Shark Tank, and um, he did a, a wonderful presentation. So um, all kinds of things are happening in our region, and we just want to make sure that we provide kind of a central location where we can uh, pull things together, provide an infrastructure that can provide a lot more continuity and support uh, to facilitate growth. And, and we're excited about being part of that. And a key part of that is the SBDC. And we appreciate everything you're doing, Kelly. You've been uh, a real rock during this uh, pandemic and everything you all have been able to do. I know a lot of small businesses probably owe their continuing existence to things you've done and the advice you've given them. So thank you for that. And thank you for working with us. Well, thank you. But it, Maureen gets all the credit. <laughs> Deservably so as well. Uh, just to go through the chat real quick, I know I see we've ran a minute long, which um, is the norm. Um, let's see here. There's stuff in the chat that Maureen has placed in as far as related to the Kern County micro grant program for our smallest, neediest, and most vulnerable small businesses. So there's information there you can find in the chat. There's information on the California Dream Fund. There's also information in, oh, a question also, who is mirroring this program in Stockton, California? Stockton uh, is actually in a different region. I know in Modesto, it would be the Valley Sierra SBDC, which is in our central California region. And you'd wanna contact Herman, the director. Uh, if I recall, the program in Stockton, it's changed um, leadership, and I believe it is offered by the Asian Chamber of Commerce is who I would check with them. And I'm not sure what they're doing in the, that would be in the Northern California region. Uh, we see a flyer also for the uh, employee retention tax credit. So thank you so much. And thank you so much, Dr. Stark, for joining us. It's great to have you on and to learn more about what's happening with the center. It's exciting and a great time. Oh, thank you very much. We're really looking forward to it and looking forward to working with everyone out there. So if we can help, please let us know. Well, thank you. And we will be back next week for uh, our 116th consecutive webinar on June 1st, 2022. So for Dr. John Stark, I'm Kelly Bearden. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye now.